Well, welcome everyone uh, to a, a great opportunity for us. I'm just really pleased to have uh, Clifton Tal Talbert with us today. And we're gonna be hosting a conversation about entrepreneurship, uh, his life story, and uh, one of his publications called Who Owns the Ice House? So I'm gonna begin today by introducing Clifton formally with his bio, and then we're gonna begin a presentation um, he's going to talk about entrepreneurship and then, and then really tell you his story. So really pleased to have you with us today. Clifton Talbert is an award-winning author, an entrepreneur, an educator, an inspiration, and a CEO of two different companies. Time Magazine recognizes him as one of America's top emerging entrepreneurs, and his first book, Once Upon a Time When We Were Colored, became an international bestseller and a major motion picture. He has presented at Harvard University. Principal Center, the United States Air Force Academy, Bank of America, BMW, North Iowa Area Community College, and more. He has spoken to K-12 educators from the Mississippi Delta to China and has influenced international school leaders throughout Central America. It's my honor to welcome back to NIAC, Mr. Clifton Talbert. And um, as we begin our conversation this morning, I thought just, just for uh, the sake of the listeners, could you begin by just defining uh, entrepreneur? It's a relatively ambiguous term and really relatively new to the English language, uh, at least the daily language. So could you start by just giving us what your definition of an entrepreneur is, Clifton, before you begin your comments? Well, President Shields, first let me thank you and NIAC for the invitation to speak to your people. Uh, this is a very exciting time for me in spite of COVID-19. As you can probably see here, I have my mask, I have on my gloves, and my wife gave me instructions to drink plenty of water while I'm talking. So I've, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. And, and, and to some extent, that is what an entrepreneur is all about, doing everything that you're supposed to do. Uh, it's commitment and follow through. It's about persistence. It's about tenacity. It's about uh, going forward in spite of the barriers and roadblocks that might be there. Because nearly every endeavor that humankind finds himself or herself involved in, those endeavors can really end or not follow through. But the entrepreneurial mindset places you in a position, I can do this and I will do this. Very good. Well, with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you and let you give us a little background about your story. And as we get into some of the lessons that you've learned, I'll have some questions to ask you. And uh, we'll just try to make this as conversational as we can. All right. Well, good. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm delighted to be using Zoom. Uh, about a month ago, I couldn't even spell Zoom. So it's amazing, again, what the entrepreneurial mindset does. It gives you reason to believe that the impossible is possible and that learning more is just part of the opportunity that we have. And, and for example, let's think about the candle. Uh, growing up in the Mississippi Delta, before electricity became a part of all of our lives, we had candles. And uh, now, of course, uh, the electricity was there, but my great aunt who raised me knew how to read the meter. And when it got to a certain point, she stopped. She said, I'm not only going to pay the Mississippi Power and Light a dollar and 55 cent, period. So if it goes over that, lights goes out and the candles goes on. But there was a time in history when candles literally lit the world. So what do you think about that? Would, would that always be? And that is what happened in the entrepreneurial space. What once was is no longer. And what is possible begins to become our reality. So you light the candle, but let's imagine the light bulb. Wow, it, it's amazing. Castles were lit by candles, but now wherever we are, we just push a button and the lights are there. And this all comes from the mind of the entrepreneur, that person who believes that something better and of greater value can be added to the human population. Well, what about the idea, Steve, uh, when this whole notion of entrepreneurship as a term became very big in our country? Because growing up in the Mississippi Delta, even though entrepreneurs were there, I never really heard that word before. As you probably know, 
It's a French derivative. And we didn't speak French in Glen Allen. But the word we heard was gumption. Uh, that was their comprehensive word to explain that person who was going to make it regardless of what the circumstances may have been. But in 2007, 2008, something happened around the world and in our country particularly. First of all, it was the world economic crisis. I mean, we had no idea what was going on. Countries were failing, not just a business within a country, but countries were failing. And as a result of that, we had to think in terms of how do we live beyond this? How do we live beyond this? It is not it's different, Steve, but it's somewhat reminiscent of, of what we're currently going through right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it seems as if the economic downfall was out of our control. And in 2008, when all of the economists from around the world met in Davos, Switzerland, to look at the possibilities of what we needed to do as a world, as a global, as global partners, they came up with the idea that an entrepreneurial experience should be on everybody's plate, that everyone should experience the opportunity to tap into their creativity, to tap into their innovative mindset, to see what they could do in order to change the circumstances in which we have found ourselves. And so the entrepreneurial thinking from my perspective at that time became a global call, not that it had not existed in small capacities before, but now it has become a global call. And people from Africa to Asia to Sepulpa, Oklahoma, to Mason City, Iowa, are beginning to think in terms of what can I bring of value to the table? How can I solve this problem? And that was when I was introduced to the Kaufman Foundation, which has an incredible global reputation around the role of entrepreneurship in all of our lives and in our country in particular. So to revive the entrepreneurial quotient, the EQ as I call it, so that we can continue to create value. This is what we must do if our country is to maintain its position and to continue to grow. We wanna always find a way to create value for others. And, and this is what happened to me. Let me just give you a little background here. Uh, as you said in the introduction, Steve, I'm a writer. I had no idea that a writer lived inside of me. But, and I was a young soldier in the military when I discovered that I had the ability to take 26 alphabets and create words that had meaning. Uh, so as a writer, it was there, but the entrepreneurial mindset that I had embraced as a kid, growing up and working around the ice house, allowed me not to give up. It took me 24 years, Steve, to get my first book published. And now I have published 15 books and nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. Being a lecturer around the world when I was a kid, all I wanted to do was go to Greenville, Mississippi. That's only 26 miles from my hometown. So what do you do when you get a call to come to Sydney, Australia, which is certainly more than 26 miles? But as a lecturer, being able to talk about entrepreneurship and innovation, that opportunity became mine because of the work that I had done with Stairmaster, the exercise machine. Uh, that system was in a process of maybe not even happening, but I became involved in the process that would allow Stairmaster to be presented to the world. And that was probably my first major entrepreneurial experience, working with something I didn't have all the ideas about, had no knowledge of physiology, no knowledge of health rates or any of the things like that that was needed for our life. But I began to take the learning process and began to understand that I could. And understanding that I could, that's part of the lessons that I learned growing up around the ice house. And most recently, we started a coffee company, Roots Java Coffee. Uh, from my perspective, some of the best coffee in the world. But I started it at a time when the world was already inundated with coffee. But I felt that I could be a difference. I wanted to make a difference in the country of Rwanda. So I said, let's do this anyway. So we started that. So my shift, my thinking was shifted at the Ice House. And that, that is what really truly made the difference. Uh, I embraced a growth mindset. 
And uh, Dr. Carol Dreck has done considerable work on the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. The fixed mindset sort of leaves you right where you are. You're not moving forward, but you're somewhat comfortable. Whereas the growth mindset said, yes, let's write. Let's go to Sydney, Australia. Let's look at Stairmaster. Let's look at coffee. Let's look at a lot of different things. Uh, this would not have happened had I not embraced the entrepreneurial quotient, that EQ mindset, that there's nothing that you can't do if you make a commitment to make it happen. So my world is now comprised of multiple opportunities that have come my way, and I'm always looking for a new one. I don't know if I'll ever stop. I think my wife wished that I would sort of make the EQ a little less prominent and, and, and look at maybe let's do something to enjoy life along the way. And I promise her that I will as soon as I get to working on this other project. Clifton, it, you, you've used the word opportunity several times in your conversation thus far. And I know that's lesson number two, so I'm skipping ahead a little bit. But, you know, just thinking about, about entrepreneurial mind, mindset and where people are today in the midst of this COVID-19, uh, where should our students be <coughs> really looking for opportunities. Any, any suggestions for us? Because clearly we're gonna need this mindset to get back to where we were prior to the pandemic. There's no question about it. Uh, I think every circumstances of crisis provides us an opportunity to discover. And, and so what are the process that we can look at that brings that discovery about? First and foremost, I think now is the time to embrace inquisitiveness to have an inquisitive mind, ask a thousand questions, why, why not, why can't I, why haven't we? And also to look at our imagination, that incredible gift that the human being has, the imagination to accelerate that. Because even the light bulb uh, that emerged from the candle uh, came about because of someone's inquisitive nature and their imagination those qualities are still needed today. And when we have a crisis, we wanna see what actions are being taken that were not being taken before. What can we do to extend that beyond just fixing a problem that exists today, but maybe discovering something that we have not discovered before. I think this is, is a perfect time to think in terms of what is the next best thing to move along the human pathway. And, and I, I think that oftentimes the experience we gain with opportunities we never planned on are really uh, what makes this open doors for us. And, and I'd like to say that, you know, I thought when I was 16, I'd be a college president, but not true. You know, it's just, it was opportunities along the way and those people I met along the way that helped mentor me and provide me the support. And I know that piece is really important in your book in, in lesson one, is really identifying those, those mentors. And, and you talk a lot about Uncle Cleve. Could you talk us a little bit about that for us? Yeah, uh, you know, as we get through this conversation, we're gonna really look very closely at Uncle Cleve because right now, Steve, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take you back to Glen Allen, Mississippi to sort of, let's, let's start out with me as to how this all happened because the entrepreneurial mindset is not just to start a business, it is to jumpstart your life. No matter what your endeavors might be, if you embrace the entrepreneurial mindset, you will end up doing that better, discovering more. And, and as you said, maybe even making contribution to society that you had not thought of or had never dreamed of. Now the fields of the Delta, that was the only world that I knew. And that's all I could see. And, and oftentimes when circumstances change, you have the opportunity to see differently. And it's in that seeing differently that you make discoveries about your own strengths and capabilities. Because when I was a migrant field worker in the Mississippi Delta, it never occurred to me that I would one day be a writer. I would one day be a lecturer, or I would have an involvement with an exercise machine yet to be invented or that I would bring about a coffee that uh, would, I think, change the taste of coffee for people. These things were not part of my thinking until I became involved in the ice house. 
And that is when I saw one man live his life in such a way that defied the rules of the day. And he became highly respected by our community. And I was delighted to have been part of his success. Uh, so Uncle Cleve is the man we're referencing, Steve. And I, I know you're well aware of Uncle Cleve in the book you've read, Who Owns the Ice House. But uh, let's just talk about that for a while. A relationship that shifted. For example, prior to working at the Ice House, we were migrant field workers. I knew that work. I didn't like it, but this, is, this was generational work that had been for generations in my family. But now here's a man who owns this business. And he has asked me to come and work with him. A relationship that shifted the trajectory of my life. That relationship for a 13 year old boy literally has stayed with me wherever I have traveled. And that to me is one of the great benefits of embracing the entrepreneurial mindset. Once you embrace this mindset, you don't give it up. It travels with you wherever you might go. So this is his teaching place, Steve. I, I don't know if, I, I know this is not like Nyack. You have a beautiful campus and your dorms are just absolutely incredible. But what do you do when you don't have Nyack? What do you do when the mentor does not have an office? What do you do when the mentor does not have a telephone or a computer? What do you do? You sit in the cab of his 1947 pickup truck. That was his teaching place. And if you can imagine with me, Steve, my uncle, this rotund man, very slow, moves with, I, I would say more methodical in his efforts, perhaps is the best way to describe him. Always smoking a pipe, Prince Abbott tobacco, and checking the oil in his car, in his truck, I would say every hour, almost. Not really every hour, but you could see Uncle Cleve with the hood raised and the dipstick pulled out. And behind where you can't see, there's a, there are the two seats where he and I would sit. And behind the seat were at least a pile of shirts that were filled with oil. I am so thankful that he did not drop a match back there. You would be talking to somebody else today. But suffice it to say, this is the place where those lessons were taught. But you know, Steve, it was also the place where I observed him. Because I think in the mentoring process, it is not just the words that are given, but it's the observations that you make. You see what the mentor does and you begin to have a clear understanding of the impact of that action that he or she might be taking and what that can mean for you. So this, is my, this was my teaching place, became my learning place. Uncle Cleve in that time was helping me to build my personal brand. I didn't know that at the time had no idea. In fact, to be quite honest with you, I would be a little bit upset with some of the things he was suggesting because when you get into budding into a teenager, the thing that is probably most on your mind is how much fun can I have without my parents catching me? <laughs> and Uncle Cleve was this guy who knew what fun you shouldn't have so that your parents would have no reason to catch you. So my lessons really were lessons that are just as valid today as they were then. Choose the right people to run with. Do the right thing when no one is looking. I mean, these are life lessons that would help me to literally build my brand. The brand is who I am. This is what the world sees. This is what my wife will see. This is what my son will see. This is what his friends will see. And this is what the people who work with me will see. But I started building that brand at the Ice House more than 50 years ago. You know, that's a long time, Steve. So we won't use 50 again, so we so don't bring that one up, okay? <laughs> we just keep moving on. Okay. Uncle Cleve did not know the word entrepreneurship, but the word that he used was gumption. Now, if you can imagine this, we're sitting in the truck, driving very slow, and uh, Uncle Cleve was laughed at by the kids in the community because they could keep up with his truck. They, they said, why have a truck they can't outrun us. But Uncle Cleve saw the speed limit. He went by the speed limit. I had no choice. I'm sitting in there with him. So suffice it to say, by maybe by osmosis, I went by the speed limit as well. 
And I would try not to look at my friends who would be running alongside the truck. Go faster, man, go faster. Uncle Cleve never said a word, just had his pipe in his mouth and stayed at about 18 to 23 degrees, uh, 23 miles an hour. I mean, he found no reason to go 50, but that's what the kids wanted him to go. But it was that man in his life that introduced to me the word gumption. For him, it was the entrepreneurial experience. It encompassed everything that we call today the entrepreneurial mindset, persistence, stick with what you start, tenacity, hang in there, don't give up, you know, and if you need some answers, go to someone who may have answers for you. So he was helping me to understand then that I could literally win where I stood. And part of that winning was I graduated from high school and that was big in my day and in my community because most of the young men, they wanted to do this, but they also had field work to do. But I was very fortunate in my great aunt and Uncle Cleve said, you're going to get an education. And so part of that gumption that I brought into my life gave me the wherewithal to study and to do the things that my teachers required of me. And I graduated valedictorian of my class. And secondly to that, I valued myself. And that is very important. When you are a migrant cotton field worker and the cotton fields of the Delta is all you have known all your life, you can lose value in what your opportunities might be and what the potential that you might have. But working at the Ice House gave me the opportunity to not only graduate from high school as valedictorian of my class, but it gave me the ability to value myself. And I think that is so very important. When you realize what you can do, what you can accomplish, and how others can help you to accomplish that, that alone make all the difference in the world. The impact of mentoring is just incredible. And, and it's part of the entrepreneurial journey. We can truly learn from others. Well, that's me, Steve, at 17. Graduating from high school. Right you like that? I do, very much. Yeah, that, that's, that's me at 17. I show that to my son. I say, that's me. That has to be you. But of course, he has graduated from high school and college now. But at 17 is when I left the Glen Allen Ice House, believing in myself. But I realized that more than ice had been lifted. He lifted my mind about me and what I could accomplish. And what I didn't realize, which is perhaps the greatest part of the gift, is that there is no better time than now for students, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, no matter what they are doing, to believe in themselves, to clearly understand that they have this gift of inquisitiveness, they have the ability to accelerate their imagination, and as we find our way moving through COVID-19, that hopefully we will find ways to have vaccines already in the pool of study, knowing now that the pandemics can happen at will. But what can we bring to the table so that we can be ready and more prepared than we currently are? This kind of embodied in a quote that I read in one of your publications that the ability to choose the way we respond to our circumstances is perhaps the single most powerful ability we have as human beings. And, and that really embodies what you just suggested is we're in a bad spot right now but we have the ability to overcome and, and following these principles can help us get there. Yeah, and, and the connecting that we're doing, because what I'm convinced that the answer does not re rest in, in one person alone, but, but when we connect and, and when we build community around the opportunity, then we will find that the pieces of the puzzle that we are looking for, they are there. They are somewhere on this globe, global planet. They are there. And as we work hand in glove together to find these answers and do the things that we need to do, we will discover the potential that is necessary to truly make a difference in currently where we are. Gumption traveled with me. Now, the reason I want to talk about that now in our conversation, well, well Steve, let me ask you a question, if you don't mind. Where did you grow up? 
I grew up in, in a, a very small community of about 200 people in uh, rural Iowa. Uh, my dad was a, a, a junior high principal and uh, I, worked on a, I worked on a farm as a, as a kid and had some of those same gumption lessons on the wrong end of a cow that, uh, that you might be able to relate to. <laughs> yeah, you know, when you said 200 people, you define Glen Allen, Mississippi. So yeah. it, it, it somewhat believed that we had some similar, similar life experiences. But uh, it, it's about Clifton, but it's also about Steve. It, it's about all of us. What can we bring to the table together to make a difference in the world where we live? What will we leave as a clear example of our having been here and have an impact at the world in a very positive way? And the lesson that I learned from Uncle Cleve, the gumption that became part of my life, when I took the Illinois Central at 17, I didn't leave gumption behind. It stayed with me, Steve. And that's the good thing about the entrepreneurial mindset. Once a student graduates from college, uh, from NIAC, uh, he or she will have those lessons to take with them wherever they go. If they go on to a four-year institution, they will be better prepared to use that entrepreneurial mindset to really hunker down and really bear with the opportunity they have in front of them. If they go into business for themselves, they will have that mindset that will help them to understand, I can do this and I will do this. And if they go on to work for someone else, they will become among the better employees because they will clearly understand that they have value that they can bring to that company. And that as that company recognizes their value, they become better in the process. Yes, yeah, so this is the Illinois Central, and I boarded the train, but gumption, that mindset boarded the train with me as well. Uncle Cleve's voice was in my ear. I mean, the man's voice is still in my ear 50 years later. You go to a family reunion that we might have. On Saturday afternoon, we have what we call Cleve Talk, so that every family member that's involved in an entrepreneurial endeavor, they have five minutes to stand up and tell the family, this is what we're doing. Now, if they go over five minutes, a bell sound and they have to leave. We pull them off the stage. We, but we tell them to be very succinct. And most of my family are Southerners and we didn't have to be succinct as a Southerner. We could just keep talking. But on Saturdays, we have to be succinct. But Uncle Cleve's voice is not just in my ear, but in the ears of many others as well. And I was among the last of the great migration. Of, of African Americans leaving the South, moving North, East, and West. But I'm so very appreciative of the fact that Gumption boarded the Illinois Central with me and has stayed with me even today. It's a real part of my life. The only difference is I gave it a new name, Entrepreneurial Quotient. Well, let's look at my journey, uh, Steve, because I, I want every student to clearly understand that the entrepreneurial mindset is not just for one place in time, but it is for all the places and for all the time. This is where I started in the Mississippi Delta. But I went from there to St. Louis, Gumption went with me. I became one of the employees hired at the Jefferson Bank and Trust that ended the civil rights movement in St. Louis. I went from there to the military. Here I am a young soldier, Dow Air Force Base, and Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, DC. At both places, I was able to excel, not because I was extraordinarily bright, but I understood tenacity. I understood perseverance. I understood asking questions. I understood getting the job done well. These are the lessons that I learned at the Ice House, the same lessons that I took with me to the military. And once leaving the military, I found myself in Oklahoma coming to Oklahoma to finish college, got married. Then I went on to Texas to graduate school again, doing work that I had never done before, working with young men and women from literally around the United States who were in the Graduate School of Banking at Southern Methodist University. I had to apply gumption again. It went with me everywhere I went. And then of course, I was a banker for a while. And it requires a lot of gumption to be a banker. How do you get the person to come to your bank as opposed to the 30 other banks that's on every corner in your city? And how do you get them to make their loans with you 
and bring their deposits to you. That was my job. That was my responsibility. How do you sell ice to everybody? I had to figure out that out in the Mississippi Delta. And I brought those same lessons with me into the banking world. But it was during that time that I really discovered that the writing that I had started while in the military would eventually in 1989 produce a writer. My very first book was published. It became an international bestseller and subsequently a major motion picture. None of these things were on my radar. The thing that was on my radar was I can do this and I will do this. And I applied the entrepreneurial lessons to every single area that I would find myself. And it was in that time that my first com company was established, the Fremont Corporation. And that started me on the road that I'm on today, that I would own my own business. I would be like Uncle Cleve. Owning my business is really my homage to him and what he taught me. The financial crisis of 2008, 2009 happened in all of our lives, Steve, and uh, it changed lives all over the world. Uh, it was very global, but it did not have the, it, it, the same impact, fortunately, that, uh, that uh, COVID-19 is having. It is totally world covered. But the economic world was hit hard in 2007, 2008, and 2009. And again, it was a call for entrepreneurship and gumption because part of that had to do with that crisis, but not only the crisis, but the lines of economic defense that had been applied, entrepreneurship was on the front. What had to happen? The economic forum of 2008 in Davos, Switzerland brought all of these economic minds together. And they said, okay, Everything is happening in Detroit. Everything is happening in Germany. Everything is happening in Japan. The car industry seems to be failing all over the world. Thousands, tens of thousands of people are without work now. We got to look at what can be done to offset this. We need the average citizen, citizens like Clifton Talbert, citizens like Steve Schultz, citizens like Lindsay, citizens like Jessica. We need these citizens thinking of what they can do. We need them thinking about tapping, if you will, their intellectual capital, tapping, if you will, their entrepreneurial mindset so that they can bring something to the marketplace that will help us during this time of crisis. And of course, at the same time that the crisis was going on in the automobile and financial industries, the West Coast was also embracing technology in a way that it had not been embraced before and they would be able to come in and bring with them a tool that we could all make part of our lives that would help bring about the changes that we would need in order to get out of the 2008 financial crisis and to have a new platform from which we would do our work and make our discoveries about our future. So we were going from Wall Street to Main Street. And uh, that to me was just a major thing that an average person was, let's say in your hometown of, 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 of Iowa, of 200 people, Steve, before technology brought, with, brought to us the ability to have the internet to become our store and to move things, we had to rely upon a few people in a few places. But technology introduced us to the world. And so people who had good ideas, good products and good services were now able to see these goods and services become reality, become products that were being sold all over the world. This again speaks to the entrepreneurial quotient, what it means and what it does for all of us. Now, while all of this was going on, one of the things happened that I think change my life as related to the conversation that we currently hold about entrepreneurship, about innovation, about creativity, and about the mindset, the growth mindset that can literally change your life. There was a young man by the name Gary Shanaga, uh, who I had never met before and he had never met me, but he had heard me talk about Uncle Cleve and the Ice House. 
doing an interview that he had given several years earlier. So when an opportunity came to speak at an entrepreneurial conference in Texas, he invited me and I invited Uncle Cleve because I had learned by now that if Uncle Cleve isn't there with me, I really don't have a story to tell. So Uncle Cleve came to Texas with me in an incredible entrepreneurial conference that also introduced us to the Kaufman Foundation and the opportunity that in 2010, my mentor becomes a book. The 1947 pickup truck, The Lessons from the Ice House became this book in 2010. And I left me with the idea that our shared journey mattered. Steve, what did you first think about the book when you read it, when you uh, found it? Well, interestingly enough, I was given the book uh, by Gary um, at the National Association of Community College Entrepreneurs Conference. And I hadn't heard of it. Um, I was relatively new to my presidency and that organization. Read it on the way home. Um, and I thought this would be a, a great book for our Common Read initiative, which we ended up selecting it for that. And, and I handed it off to Lindsay and, and uh, Liz at the time. And I just said, hey, here's a book you might want to throw in the mix for, for Common Read. So it impressed upon me immediately. Um, you know, as complicated as life gets sometimes, when you really boil it down to the eight lessons, um, you know, and, and your eight uh, habits of the heart as well, these are just common principles for success that apply to everybody, whether you're going to start a business or whether you're, you're going to take a different path in life. So that's what struck me and caused me to hand it off to our team um, in, in the very beginning. You know, when Gary and I partnered to make this happen, I really had no idea that the Ice House story would become a global story. Uh, I knew it was a good story because in every book that I had written, I had always included a chapter about Uncle Cleve because I realized how he had impacted my life. But I had a very narrow focus, how he had impacted my life. But when Gary became involved in the process, we began to look at it from a much broader perspective. If this man can make a decision to have his life changed in a world at a time when it would almost be impossible or seemingly impossible to do so, then surely we can bring this into the area that all people literally can benefit from the Ice House experience. So in 2010, Uncle Cleve became a book. Uh, and and I, I just wish that he would have been alive to know this for himself because he had very little formal education, but was always attuned to his value and always attuned to success. Lesson number one is choose your mindset. Your thinking is your choice. And that is one of the great lessons for me is that how a person thinks helps to determine their actions, but more importantly, their expectations. <laughs> So I am glad that I had the opportunity to be in that 1947 pickup truck and to realize that I could make decisions about my future, that I had a choice, what I wanted to do. And even though barriers and roadblocks may have been there, and they were, but my mind was free to travel beyond that reality to the reality that I would create for myself. And this to me is what the entrepreneurial mindset does. It takes you to that other place. Lesson number two is to seize the opportunity. See past your present reality. Because oftentimes the present reality reminds me of being stuck in a box. And, and the box growing up would have been the cotton fields of the Delta. That is the work that was presented us. This is what it was there to do. Uncle Cleve started out as a field worker himself, but he got out of that box and he at one time owned a small farm. And when the farm failed, he didn't quit. He now got into the ice business and really soared 
and realizing how he had moved through all of those channels and not allowing his present reality to keep him from seizing the opportunity. When the ice house came up for sale, he had squirreled away. Squirrel is a Southern term for saving money. He had squirreled away enough money to buy the ice house. And, uh, and that's the only owner I ever, I never knew the other owner because I would, maybe I wasn't even born at the time or I was too young to know. When I grew up to know anything at a, of, of age, Uncle Cleve was the owner of the Ice House in Glen Allen. Lesson number three, move into action. Move into action. You know, there are a lot of people who think about doing things. I'm going to do this. And I know within the field of academia, there's a lot of thinking going on. But as I look at what you said, when Gary gave you the book, at the conference where you attended. You could have easily read the book, put it away, but you put the book in a place of where action could take place and action did take place. And it is now being a benefit, not only to the students who go through that course, but the employers and the business that they may start. Uh, it is impacting because you took action. You accelerated your imagination. And we all have the opportunity to do that. The fourth lesson is learn all you can. And for many people that I, I've graduated from college now, I really don't want to read the life of Leonardo da Vinci. The book is just too thick. I don't want to read Steve Jobs' life. It's just too thick. But you know, in order to really maximize our potential, we have to look at every opportunity to learn all we can, that we take advantage of that, to also have that inquisitive nature, to realize that as a child, ask a thousand questions. And oftentimes that child could be put down, but we don't wanna do that. We want questions to be asked so that answers can be forthcoming. So that's why lesson number four in Who Owns the Ice House is about Uncle Cleve, learn all you can. When he wasn't selling ice, he was fixing high dollar cars. He had more manuals than the manual store, if such a place exists. This man was always reading, trying to figure out, how do I fix these cars? How do I become the best person doing this? And then of course, there was the radio. And every night he would listen at the news from around the world. He wanted to know what was going on. We need to nurture our mind, we need to learn all we can. Clifton, Lesson number five. Yes, I'm sorry, Steve, go ahead. Clifton, you're, you're talking about that connection between knowledge, really, effort, and then positive outcome. Can you, can you tell me a little more about that mindset? Knowledge, effort, and positive outcome. Well, you notice effort is in the middle. And that is either where we succeed or fail. Case in point, I told my son, who has a small business, he knows the business. I said, but Marshall, if you're not willing to put forth the effort that's gonna be required of you, your business will simply be a dream in your head. The outcome that you expect will never happen without your effort being there. So, and that is the thing about Uncle Cleve. He lifted ice, he carried ice, he bought ice, he sold ice. He swept the place, he kept the place, he counted the money, he kept it clean. Everything that was involved in making that business successful, I saw him do it. And when it was my time, I did it as well. I learned from him that if effort is not expended, you can, be, you can rest assured that there will be no outcome. Effort is absolutely critical. Thank you. Lesson number five is build wealth. And Uncle Cleve taught me to look at money as a strategic partner to get you to the next place, to get you to the next opportunity. He said, never look at money as something to show off who you are and what you have. He said, that's your business and no one else's business. But look at money that you save and put aside to allow you to achieve your dream, to get to the other place. You may need to buy something, fix something, or add on to something. If you don't have the funds to do it, 
in those days, banks were not necessarily lending to small communities like that, and especially communities on outside of the town. So you had to learn to save and to have that money yourself in order to get to the next level. Now today, banks exist to lend, and hopefully those policies of lending to whomever needs and have the wherewithal to repay it is what really happened so that we can see economic growth no matter where we are. But from the standpoint of wealth, Uncle Cleve was not a showboat at all. I mean, you would never have known what his value would have been by what he dressed in, the cars that he had, or the home that he lived in. A nice home, yes. Food, or every meal, yes. But he, I think his one great act of affluence would have been his pipe and his Prince Abba tobacco. Lesson number six, you are your brand. And, and that's what he said. Now, Uncle Cleve sort of tied it to the family. He said, you represent the family. And, uh, and, and oftentimes those conversations are not necessarily held as much today as perhaps they were then. And he meant, you know, your great grandparents, all of those people are looking to you to do well. And so you have to, he says, so that there are certain things that you might want to do and they may not necessarily be bad, but it won't be good for the family if you do that. So my suggestion to you is don't do it. Always remember you are your own brand. Your actions, what you do seven days a week, 24 seven, that becomes the billboard that other people will read and make their decisions about you. You are your own brand. Clifton, how has how has your brand changed or evolved as uh, from a young man until uh, until you, you know, reached a successful entrepreneur? How has it evolved? I would say I still try to follow the lessons that were taught to me by Uncle Cleve. Uh, because I had early on embraced him and his lesson as something that he had given me. And it was Gary that helped me to understand that Clifton, he's given this to the world as well. So everything that he taught me and everything that I do, I try to think in terms of who am I impacting? Who will I impact? What effect will it have if I do this? Should I do this now? Should I do it later? or should I leave it alone or walk away from it? I would say that over the years, I've become more resolute, if you will, in doing those things that are good for the family. And if they're good for the family, they tend to also be a good brand for the business as well. Driven by unselfishness drives me in just about everything that I do. Thank you. Lesson number seven, relationships matter. Ray build bridges between people. So what is Ray? That's the, that's the optimum word today. Ray is an acronym for respect, affirmation, and inclusion. If we bring those three things into the life of another person, we will have built the bridge that will provide for travel back and forth for all times to come. And Uncle Cleve understood this. Oftentimes, he gave respect. He affirmed others. He was inclusive. He may not have received all of that, but that did not make those things wrong because he didn't receive them. He understood Ray as being something that was bigger than any group of people. It was something that we could all adhere to, that every single one of us could bring into the table. I mean, I have the capacity to respect you. I have the capacity to, to affirm you. I have the capacity to include you. And if I do those things, then my life will be better served. And that's what he always taught. Your life will be better served if you do the right thing. And it is the right thing that build those bridges from one silo to the next. And the last lesson is be persistent. And it looks as if here, let's see. Okay. 
Got it. The last lesson is be persistent. No one was more persistent than Uncle Cleve. And that is the easiest thing not to be because persistence requires a part of us that oftentimes we don't let out. We keep it locked up. We want things to happen immediately. And if they don't happen, we give up. But I have often said on Twitter, if you keep giving up, you will eventually give out. So you don't want to give up. You want to stay intact with what you believe and what you want to see accomplished. You want to resolve to succeed and never quit. To have a resolute, a resolution within your own mind. This is what I've started. This is what I will finish. Every student who comes into, and especially our first gen students who find themselves in college, I want them to clearly understand that they should never give up. Always have that resolution to succeed. Even if you've never done this before, it simply means now is your time to do it. Uh, having never done it is not an excuse to embrace now is the time to do it. Many of the things that I have done, I have never done them before, but I realize that now is always the time. And I also realize that we will always be able to see more in front of us than what's behind us. So keep looking ahead. I had no idea that beyond the fields of the Delta, that Uncle Cleve would show up and, and that high school would show up that college would show up, that business ownership would show up, and that one day I would be in Tulsa, Oklahoma, talking to the college president in Mason City, Iowa by Zoom. Zoom did not exist when I was there, but I stayed with it. And because I stayed with it, I can participate. And lastly, beyond constraining fields, this is what I would say for all of us. And we will borrow a quote from Abraham Lincoln to close us out. Looking forward, a timeless quote by the 16th president of the United States of America. Your own resolution to succeed is more important than any other. For a man who had as many failures as he had successes, I think it's a very appropriate ending quote. He became the 16th president at the right time in America's history, but he could have stopped. He could not have gone on to that account in 1861, that incredible Douglas Lincoln debates. He could have chosen to quit, but he chose to go on. And I think on the night before he won, as a writer, I have imagined that he walked into the bedroom and he told Mary Todd Lincoln, Mary, I think we're going to make it. I think we're going to make it. That's what it's all about. We can make it.